All right, guys, we're going to wait about three more minutes, see if a couple of these others show up. If not, we're going to go ahead and take off, and it's going to be, what, about an hour? About an hour to get there. Um, I'll be waiting once we get there. Mark is already. He's already emailed and texted me about 16 times this morning. He's very anxious and excited. So um, we're going to have lunch that will be there. We'll have drinks, uh, water, soft drinks, that sort of stuff. Enjoy your bus ride. And I look to see you guys there real soon. Uh, Woohoo! Someone asked nice earlier, it's my first time driving. <laughs> Actually, it's my second. When I woke up this morning to get the bus to bring it here, now we're gone. George. <laughs> Good to see you. Welcome to St. James Parish. This is Mark Ryan. Mark's going to give us a little bit of history about Farik and tell us about his factory, and we're going to start the tour. And, and then, um, you know, we'll go through the buildings, and we got a, a major treat with the lunch. It's been catered by Todd's Catering, which has the best po' boys in the parish. <laughs> but we got another special treat, which I... Max, how's it going, man? Good to see you. I don't know if you know uh, Max Stokeby. His dad is Eric Stokeby. His grandfather. <laughs> now, another thing which we have, which is a real treat, and, and I don't know if you knew about it or not, but um, I had my staff prepare little baggies for everybody. And each bag has eight different types of tobacco. Okay, so we got Latakia, Pariks, and Virginia Orientals and stuff. So just so you can see the varietal components that go into a pipe blend that you smoke. And I thought what we'd do is we would have a little blending experiment where you can mix some stuff that you think you might like and have something to make as your own blend to try. And we're very lucky because we got we got Phil and Pat here. Missouri Mission, they're real famous, you might know them. Just as I say freak, they say Missouri Mission. And they brought some pipes in case any of you didn't bring a pipe. I asked them if they'd bring some. And that way you can try some of the blends that you do with this. We're going to have a blast. Depends on how the time goes. We might do that first and then eat. Depends on how hungry everybody is. Okay. And I'm Mark Ryan. I bought the property in, actually I bought the business in the state in 2005. Okay. Because when I first bought it, I had a partner, and we didn't really own the property, we didn't own the presses or anything. And whenever we came in, I was always having to stay at a hotel, either Gonzales, which is towards Baton Rouge, or La Place, towards New Orleans. So I wanted to buy a house nearby, and I mentioned to Carol Poche that I was looking for a house, and he offered me to buy this house, which when I bought it was in ruins. It was in around 2000, and had a storm, and a tree fell right through the middle. And this was actually two houses from the 1800s that Mr. Pochet moved together, okay? And this little addition on the side wasn't there originally. Well, Mrs. Pochet had eight boys, okay? And after the eighth child, she told Mr. Pochet she wanted her own room. <laughs> so, he built that for her. And the back used to be a little A-frame, too, all right? I mean, it was in ruins. The middle was just all rotten out and everything because it was like Niagara Falls. So I had some different roofing guys come in in order to get it stable. And the first two guys said, well, we'll be able to save the, the house, but we're going to have to tear that little addition off. And I didn't go for that because I thought it was historically significant. The third guy said, I can save that, but what I'll do is I'll have to bring this, this back building up about six feet. So it still had that eight pitch on the back. He said, and what you do is for phase two, you can uh, uh, scab it out. You can bring that up kind of like a dormer on the whole back and get a 600 square foot man cave. So in phase two of the renovation, I did that. So it's two stories in the back now, but historically it was not. This front part is from the mid 1800s and the front of the, the house was from the late 1800s. And I restored that and now I stay here. And it was funny when I brought the old guys in, they were talking about how they had eight boys there and one bathroom. Okay. And now I'm there by myself and I got three bathrooms. <laughs> and, and it was so touching because they're all in their late 70s and 80s. And when I brought them around to see what I'd done to the house, they were all crying. And, and it was very interesting to me, too, how they told me there's the steps going up, which actually before it was just the library on that front part. And from up there, 
You can see over the levee and see the water on the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Poche was telling me when he was a child, they'd sit on the steps and they'd look through the banister and their papa, which they called him, called him down one at a time and they'd have their little stocking and they'd get a walnut and an orange and that was their Christmas present. <laughs> okay. And the Pochets were an interesting family. The brothers were very competitive. Another really cute story. Carol, who was a real jokester, um, would get in fights with the brothers all the time. And he was laughing about how he got in a fight with, with Leon. He's the Leon, everybody calls him. He's the older brother. And he convinced Leon, because the mom was fussing and they were fighting, to come outside. Okay? So he comes out this back door, and Carol does one of these in the window, figuring he's safe. Leon reels back and punches him through the window. So I've heard that was about the fourth time they had a fight and got the window punched out. But that's the story on the house. Okay. Well, when I bought the place, it was just the business. We didn't own any of the property. So I ended up offering on this. And Carol went to Mr. Leon and said, why don't we sell the whole property? So I bought the whole property in uh, early 2007. And I did that because I was concerned once Mr. Boucher died, we'd have 40 or 50 grandchildren right in the field. If we had any, because we didn't own the presses or anything, so I was concerned about the stability in the future. My partner didn't want to buy it. He didn't see the future of that. He thought this was just going to be shedding cash, and I knew that wasn't the case. So I ended up buying him out in December of 2007, thankfully, because he didn't have any vision for this place at all. This first building over here is the oldest one. It's coming up on 100 years. The metal building over there is actually a cow barn. Um, this is from about 1970. And then about five years ago, I built a receiving station. It's on top. Okay? And then they'd come over a tree beside it and put a notch, and put a big limb into that notch, and they'd lever it with that tree stump being a fulcrum. Okay? And they'd put another trunk in there, and then they'd had rocks on the end of that, that, that limb, and that would create the pressure. This pre ferments anaerobically, which means without exposure to air, under high pressure. Okay? And then the Indians did that supposedly for a thousand years until 1780 when Pierre Chenet discovered it. And if you think about it, how in the world would they come up with fermenting? Perique like that in that process. Doesn't that blow your mind? Yeah. It's like when my children were little, I always asked them the question, why you have stuff? I mean, look at a toilet. You're not pooping out behind a tree. <laughs> Appreciate the fact how this works. I showed them how the toilet works. You know, or bread. You know, who are the first people to come up with this? And I've talked about it with some friends and we've hypothesized. That old Indian guy was sitting in that TP smoking that, that pipe. His boss said, get that stinky, nasty thing out of my teeth. <laughs> right? And he's saying, man, I love this stuff. Maybe I'll just hide it in that tree trunk and I'll put some rocks on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then uh, six months later, he's like, dad, go on, where did I hide that stuff? And he opens it up and it's this black, tarry mess. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, Wee! Prick, if you smoke it straight, if you're susceptible, it's very intoxicating. As, as some of you may know. For others, if you're not vulnerable to it, you can smoke it like a maniac. <laughs> We're really high tech here. <laughs> hey, it in. works. Seems to work. It works. <laughs> hey, that's the trick. <laughs> Yeah. Sounds like important things happen. Isn't this wild? <laughs> well, when we're turning the tobacco, see the stuff in the back is all recent, so we're not we're not really involved so much with the active fermentation. But the way we process pre is everybody in? But when when we're turning the tobacco, oh my God, it's oh, so yeah. disgusting. Oh yeah, I bet. It's unbelievable. I've been up on the levee at midnight smoking a cigar, and you can smell it. It's just incredible. The process of Perique, okay, they stem the tobacco, 
and they, they'll put it on their thigh until they have about a pound and then they'll tie it into a bundle okay and then the guys will put it into the barrels and then they put the pressure on okay and they use a railroad jack which is the type of jack that you would raise a house with where it's got a handle and you pump it and that gets the high pressure okay and then once the pressure is maintained after several days they're able to put a screw jack on which are the ones you'll see around here because the screw jack will maintain the pressure for a long time all right it then starts fermenting and it will ferment for six to eight months all right and you'll actually see some bubbling we have a few that have been out there a little earlier most of the stuff in the back isn't is is just been put in the last month or two so it's not real active okay then we take the cap off and we remove all the leaves and we work them and let the tobacco breathe out and then we put them back in the barrel and put them back under pressure and we do that a minimum of three times it's very labor intensive okay so what you're seeing in here are finished barrels all right now when i bought it this back room here will come through here there was so much damage back here that you could literally crawl between the floor and the wall in the back okay during the winter months when they were taking a break they huddled over here by the heater it was so cold so i had to tear this up and put in some new flooring and restore all that in the foundation but it gave me all these jacks back here which we couldn't use before okay and then also what you see over here is an old uh, pneumatic press back when they were doing a small number of uh, barrels per year when you put 500 pounds of per week in one of these barrels which is how we sell it it takes a long time to get that in there so it doesn't blow the cap off and it takes a lot of pressure and it's hard for one person to do it so they used to use that pneumatic press well when you're doing one at a time that's okay if you're doing 25 a year when you're doing 300 you can't do that so I got some special um, railroad jacks that allow them to do that and they'll keep the pressure on for three or four days before they can put the cap on. So, <laughs> come on, look. and it ferments in its own juices. We don't add anything to it. When you see in the back, the tobacco comes in dry. We'll hydrate it with some water and and cover it so it will come to order, which is what they call it in tobacco when it gets to the point where you can handle it. And then they'll then they'll strip it and they start the process. And if you because it is a natural fermentation, if you put too much pressure initially, and that fermentation the pressure will build, it'll blow that jack off. So when you first put it, you don't put it to the point where you bring up all the juices. But once you get through some of that fermentation, you actually press it down enough. So this is the old part that I had to redo. I mean, there were no lights back here. It was just amazing how these people were treated. It was terrible. So let's go through here and or actually what we'll do I'll have you peek in here as we go out this is an old storage area George you're gonna be interested in this these four barrels over here they're the four remaining legacy barrels because when I bought it there were six barrels that were really old okay two were from 2001 release two were from 02 and two were 03 and then there were four or five others which we sold and when I bought the place one of the things I had to do for the bank was due diligence. And I asked Mr. Bush, hey, what's the gate here? You got these old barrels, were they no good? And he said, no, those were the best barrels out of the vintage, so we kept them just to see how they would do. So we got two there from 02 and two from 03. Okay, and what they would do is this is where they would store the finished barrels. And that, that little side area over there, um, and you'll, you'll see there's an inclined plane. I mean, I, I bought them a forklift and pallet jacks. They, they never had any equipment. Mr. Poche wouldn't get them in and they'd roll barrels everywhere. So now we have, you know, pallet jack and forklift. So, so that's, yeah. Now when I got the place, I'm not kidding you, they had a hose with eight repairs. And I'm looking at him. <laughs> you know, Mr. Poche, he's awfully cheap. He wouldn't let us buy a new hose. He just had to repair it. <laughs> These are the legacy barrels he was talking about. Yeah, those are four. Four legacy barrels. Yeah. When I was in the Look at this. Yeah.